Good morning, brethren, sisters, Church of the Living God. Hello. It's 8.30 a.m. my time. <laughs> Good thing none of y'all are close by uh, my person because I haven't even done any of my morning things. Um, this is something that the Lord has stirred in me to speak to you this morning about. And um, Thank you, brother. Thank you very much. Um, working on that. Uh, very beautiful. Thank you, brother. Working on that. And um, that will come, Lord willing, this week. Lord willing. Thank you. For who it is intended, you know who you are. Bless your heart and soul. To start, <laughs> I have to mention this. Um, get the authorized version of the scriptures and turn in it very quickly. I want us to look at just one verse to start, just to kind of remind us. Today is the fourth. Today is a very big day if you're one of these people. Uh, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 17. For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. <laughs> and of course, for they eat the bread of wickedness, the bale shaped, sun shaped, perfectly round, pucarist, and they drink the wine of violence. You know, the priest uh, does his transubstantiation, the abracadabra, hocus pocus. <laughs> yes, today is Easter. Astarte. Um, this 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 is one of two of the big woohoo holidays for the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, according to the doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church, um, the two that you as a pra practicing Catholic needs to at least go to their little satanic church building is um, Christ Mass and Estarte, okay? These are these are the two big ones for the Catholics, okay? Very, very big. Very, very big. Um, I have done a two-part video maybe two years ago, a year ago, uh, called Easter, Lent, and Eggs. I will, I will put those in the description of this video for you to watch and uh, challenge you over. To challenge you over. Uh, I'm still drinking my morning coffee, my second cup, <laughs> like you wanted to know that. But, um, you know, those of us of the Church of the Living God, the ground and pillar of the truth, those of us who are truly saved, born again, and converted, every single day, every single day that the Lord gives you, we are to praise the Lord, we are to thank the Lord, for his mercy, that he has saved us. And to relegate the thanks for what he did for us because of what we did to him, to relegate it onto just one day? Hmm. I think you're missing something. And hence, the question, what does it mean to you? What does the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, mean unto you? What meaneth his blood unto you? What does it mean to you? There are a lot of people out there who, when you ask them that, they will go through and they will give you an appropriate, accurate, scriptural response. And amen, amen to that. 
But see, a lot of people, when you ask them of that, what is the response? It's a, it's a mechanic. It's a mechanical thing, such as the Catholic. What is the... What does the death, burial, and resurrection mean to you? Well, he died for, you know, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten. They quote John 3.16. Like, yes, that, that's good. Bravo. Bravo. But what does it mean to you? Uh, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Christ died for sinners. Yes, bravo. Good for you. Yes. Amen. But what does it mean to you personally? Hmm? What does it mean to you personally? Hmm? See, the fake can quote to you the mechanic of just quoting, if that makes sense, without it being personal. Is the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, personal unto you? Is the blood that he shed on the cross that cleanseth us from all sin, is it personal? Turn in your authorized version of the scriptures, that's known as the King James Version, to Psalm 34. Psalm 34. What does it mean to you? You fake! Huh? You're going to quote the scripture without having the life of the Lord Jesus Christ within you? Huh? What does it mean to you? What does it mean to you? You might, you may be aware and know that you're lost and you're going to hell. Okay, now, now stop right there. You know you're lost and you're going to hell. Stop. And think about that. Does that scare you? Does the thought of hell scare you? It's not, going to hell is not this Bullinger uh, thing where you go and then your soul be annihilated. No, no, you need to read Mark chapter 9 about that, okay? In hell, you're going to burn forever. You're going to be tormented. The pain will never cease. And see, Hollywood. And the Catholics themselves, they, they like to point out to you that, um, oh, hell is just merely being separated from God. No, no. It's not a separation from God. Who runs hell? <laughs> Who's in charge of hell? Guess what? Our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. Lucifer is not on a throne in hell, ruling or whatever. No, 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 no. Hell was made or prepared for the devil and his angels. He's not sitting on a throne in hell, dear friend. Well, God, why would God send someone to hell then? He's giving you the way to get out of it. But there's something that you need. You have to have fear. You know, going on almost 13 years ago, the Lord brought me onto himself through the book of Romans. Your indictment is chapter 1 and 2, and in chapter 3 up to verse 18. Okay? That's your indictment from the Lord against you, lost man, lost woman. And in Romans chapter 3, he gives you here, oh, and by the way, here's the answer. Then he goes into talking about our Lord Jesus Christ, okay? The Lord scared the hell out of me. 
The Lord scared the hell out of me. And then, out of scaring the hell out of me, He made me know what He did for me because of what I did to Him. See, you cannot love the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, unless you fear Him. And see, all these fake people in the church buildings, these Christians, how can you love someone whom you're afraid of? Nay. You cannot love the Lord unless you fear Him. I beg your pardon. Psalm 34. And you're lost. This isn't making sense to you. I get that. Of course. You need to be aware of the reality of your situation. And fear the Lord. Because like I said, unless you fear the Lord, you can never love Him. You can never love the Lord unless you fear Him. What, is He a genie in a bottle, in a bottle to you? I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. Stop. Stop. Without the Lord, there is no hope for you. Without the blood shed on the cross to pay for your sin, you're in your sins. What hope have you in anything without the Lord Jesus Christ? You got cars, huh? You got the money, huh? You die, you're not taking that with you. Vanity of vanity, saith the preacher. All is vanity. Our prayer for you is that the Lord scare the hell out of you. I mean that. That the Lord scare the hell out of you. Because again, unless you fear the Lord, there's no way you can truly love him. Those of you of the Church of the Living God, the ground and pillar of truth, you know what that means. You who are fake, you who are not saved, I might as well be speaking in an unknown tongue to you. Amen? Well, let's continue. Verse 5. They looked onto him and were lightened, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. Are you poor? Nick, get, get out of your head this money. Get out of your head this. What does it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Nothing you possess is going to be able to buy your way into the Lord's graces, into his mercy. God forbid. The angel of the Lord encampeth around, round about them that fear him and delivereth them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. 
O fear the Lord, ye his saints. And unlike what uh, the whore Catholicism teaches you, a saved person, spirit, soul, and body, man or woman, is a saint. O fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. Hold your place here. Hold your place here. Um, what is that? Psalm 84. Psalm 84. I believe that is. Might have to pause this really quick. Okay. Psalm 84. Verse 11. For the Lord God is a man is a son, S-U-N, and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he, no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. How do you walk uprightly? By taking heed thereto according to his word. That's in Psalm 119. Read that sometime. Let's continue in Psalm 34. Verse 10. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Again, no good thing will he withhold from them who walk uprightly. Come ye children, hearken unto me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is he that desireth life and loveth many days, that he may see good? Note what's, note what's noted here in the scripture. Keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Job 28, 28. Hinge that in your head, okay? Job 28, 28. And unto man he said, The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. You want wisdom? Fear the Lord. You want understanding? Depart from evil. How do you know what is uh, evil? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Reading the scriptures. Okay? But look at that. Verses 13 and 14. Keep thy tongue from evil. Shut up! Don't speak evil. Be not deceived. <laughs> what is it? Um, filthy communication corrupts good manners. I just probably butchered that, beg your pardon, but therein. Hmm? Watch your mouth. And thy lips that they speak no guile. By wishing curses on people. By swearing. By jesting. Hey, I'm, I'm guilty of that myself. And boy, does he chasten me for it. Depart from evil. And do good. How do you do good? By fashioning your life around the scriptures. Not fashioning the scriptures around your life. Fashioning your life according to the scriptures. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. See, your life adheres to the scriptures. You fear the Lord. You love him for what he has done for you because of what you did to him. There's a peace that passeth all understanding. That in the face of any adversity, you know that at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, you're going to be forever with the Lord. And you devils and you lost people, there ain't nothing on this earth that can give you true peace. You claim to have a lot in this world. And you know that you're, you're lost and going to hell. Read Mark chapter 9. 
Okay? Read Mark chapter 9. Look up the uh, parable of Lazarus and the uh, rich man. Okay? That's in the book of Luke. Go find it, please. You need to fear the Lord, dear friend. And you begin by knowing how worthless you are. Hi, how worthless I am. Let's continue. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth, and delivereth them out of all their troubles. And right here, verse 18. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Brokenness and sorrow. Brokenness comes first. Then sorrow. When the Lord shooed me that I was going to hell, and that I deserved to go there, that there was nothing I could do of my own accord, that all my righteousnesses were as, as filthy rags. See, unless you are of the church of the living God, that fear you can't understand. But the path that he will guide you on to himself, he will give you fear. You need to be afraid of the Lord, dear friend. You need to definitely be afraid of going to hell. The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. You fear, I feared first. And then it says here, the Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart. The breaking of your heart is that of your self-righteousness. And until your self-righteousness is broken, what good is anything that any preacher or anything you hear will do to you unless the Lord breaks you of that? And... Save as such as be of a contrite spirit. Sorrow. Sorrow. Okay? That's talking about sorrow. Verse 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. He keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and they that hate the righteous shall be desolate. That's your reward, dear friend. The Lord redeemeth the soul of his servants, and none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. Now looking at verse 18 again. The Lord is nigh on to them that are of a broken heart and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse, verse 15. Just one verse. Until you take this into your heart. <laughs> Until you take this here. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Are you the chief of sinners? Oh, I know I'm a sinner. Okay. Okay, you know you're a sinner. Good for you. Good for you. 
Job chapter 42. You know you're a sinner. Good. Yay. What do you do with that now? Yeah, what do you do with it? Hmm? Job chapter 42. Job chapter 42, verses 1 on the verse 6. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Look at what Job is saying unto the Lord. Okay, he goes to the Lord, and he says this, I know that thou canst do everything. That means save you. Okay? And that no thought can be withholden from thee. God knows all your thoughts. That alone ought to terrify you. Hi. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not, things too wonderful for me which I knew not. Hear, I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore I abhor myself. Abhor means extreme hatred. And repent in dust and ashes. Second Corinthians chapter nine. Uh, chapter seven. Excuse me. Second Corinthians chapter seven. Second Corinthians chapter seven. Verses nine on to verse eleven. See, godly sorrow has a twofold thing. Those who are seeking the Lord, who are broken and have contrition, okay? Being led unto the Lord by himself. Godly sorrow has a twofold purpose. One, for the breaking of the sinner to bring him unto himself that the Lord may save him. And those who are of the church of the living God. See, godly sorrow is not relegated just to one thing. Like some will have you to believe. It works two ways, at the least. One, to bring the one who knows unto himself through brokenness of his self-righteousness and sorrow for what you did to him. What I did to him. See, see, unless it's personal to you, boy, you ain't going to get it. You can't. Because it's relegated to what? A mechanical thing that you hear in a church building, right? And that you have all these sissies on YouTube talking about God loves you. But it doesn't become personal. And yes, I, I did call them that. Somebody got to say this to you bluntly. Here you go. Okay, you know, dabbleth with sugar, sugar coated, right? <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter 7, verses 9 on to verse 11. Now I rejoice, not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrow to repentance. For ye were made sorry. Okay, see the connection? Repentance made sorry. Okay? Okay? See the connection. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. Okay? For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. Verse 10 is talking about in the sense of it working both ways. For the lost and verse 9 is, is addressing those of the church of the living God. See, twofold, not just one. 
And verse 11 is for those of the church of the living God, what godly sorrow produces in those who are saved. Whereas verse 10 shows you, lost person, that godly sorrow, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. It's a two full, it's a it's a two-edged sword, dear friend. Okay? And you got these devils saying, oh no, 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 it's only no 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 no. It's only for the saved people. If you don't have godly sorrow, how can you be saved? You explain that one to me. And here, verse 11. The fruit. For behold this selfsame thing, that ye sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you. you. Better walk lightly. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. Indignation. I can't believe I did that. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. Yea, what revenge. What revenge? Yeah. You want to adhere yourself unto the scriptures. Once it is personal unto you, you want to please him who died, buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures for you. In all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Now, now, go to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 52. I have covered this in uh, videos before, but we are going to cover it right now. See, the hirelings of the church building, these easy believism heretic devils who are of the Jesuits, <laughs> um, they jump over scriptural repentance and twist it. Brokenness and contrition is required on your part. Oh! <laughs> yeah, you come to him thinking that you're a catch. Yeah, and that you ain't that bad. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I could name several names right here, right now. But I won't. You know, they smote him, our Lord Jesus Christ, with the palm of their hands. They ripped out his beard. And the Catholics present to you this effeminate-looking Jesus who looks like a, so pretty. He's so pretty. Isaiah chapter 52. We will start at verse 13 and 15, and then we will read the entirety of Isaiah 53. Isaiah 52, beginning at verse 13 on to verse 15 to close out that chapter, then we will be reading Isaiah chapter 53. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many were astonished at thee, his visage, his, his outer appearance, was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, God manifest in the flesh, was beaten severely to the point where you couldn't even discern the form of a man. Okay? And that was because of me.
That was my fault. What about you? Oh yeah, all have sinned, generally. But what about you? So shall he sprinkle many nations. Nations, plural. The king shall shut their mouths at him, for that which he had, for that which had not been told them, shall they see. And that which they had not heard shall they consider. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? He shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form no, nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Why? Verse 14 in Isaiah chapter 52. As many as were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. The Jews, after their king was physically decimated, okay, saw him on the cross naked. That, you, you're telling me that's our God, that's our king. So what does Mystery Babylon the Horde do? They give you this very pretty looking Jesus with a uh, look, blue eyes and whatnot. A, a very white Jesus. Um, Jesus Christ was not white. Jesus Christ was not black. Jesus Christ is Jewish. And see, when you realize that it was you who put him there, he hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Now stop right there. Stop right there. Again, what does this mean to you personally? Almost 13 years ago, when he showed me that my sin that I had did put him there. It was my fault. I, what I did, put him there. And you got these people speaking in generalities, but not taking it personal. I, me, my sin, put him on that cross. I did it to him. It's a personal you. Verse 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Yeah. Because of what I did to him. What you did to him. You ain't, you, you ain't going to get away from that. You, you can try all you want. You can look and then all other kinds of junk. But see, you're either going to deal with it now or at the great white throne of judgment. It, 
It's my fault. And guess what, dear friend? It's your fault. Be a man. Come on, be a man. Accept it. You accept it. What do you do with it? Come on, tough guy. What do you do with it? Somebody got to say this to you like this. Verse 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Now, we are, yes. But make it personal there, buddy. It was my fault. It's your fault. Because of what I did, he went to the cross. Because of what you've done, he went to the cross. And you're going to come to him in his pride, in your pride, excuse me, just thinking all I got to do is mentally believe without being broken and sorry? Lord rebuke you. It's filthy. Making yourself your own God. Verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Look at that verse. Look at that verse. Don't, look, don't look at me. Look at that verse. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Uh, you go ahead and pause this at any time and you just stare at that for a little while. Hopefully you'll get through that thick head of yours. He was oppressed. And he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death, because he, had, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. See, God's blood shed on the cross. Only God can redeem us. Hence, if Jesus Christ was just a man, then that blood would have meant nothing. And he was harmless. He never sinned. He can't sin. It's impossible for him to sin. The sinless died for the sinner who put him there. And I am a sinner who is chief. Verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall many, by his knowledge shall my righteous servant, excuse me, justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, 
and he was numbered with the transgressors. Three, not four. And he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Our Lord Jesus Christ says, I am the way, the truth, the life, the, the, the definitive, exclusive. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And guess what? Guess what? Come here. Come here. Let me let you in on a little secret. Jesus Christ is God the Father. You even said so. Look it up yourself. So what does this mean to you? What does this mean to you? Go to 1 Peter. Go to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18. Uh, no, 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 no. Verses 15. On to verse 25. 1 Peter chapter 1. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Holy, separate, other. Be not conformed to this world. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, Pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. <laughs> Just with fathers, right? Yeah but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Precious. What does the blood of Jesus Christ mean to you? It's the blood of God that cleanseth you from all sin that he shed on that cross. Because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. And only the blood of God can totally, and does, utterly, totally cleanse you. Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Oh, beg your pardon. Again. The way of the cross was chosen from the beginning. Yes. But it wasn't revealed until much later. Okay? Because they were not looking forward to the cross in the Garden of Eden. That's nuts. That's heresy. That's a lie. That kind of conflict, what we just looked at in that one verse alone. And also read Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 on to verse 7 sometime. Okay? Yeah, that looking forward to the cross from the Garden of Eden and all that stuff. No, 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 no. But the way of the cross was ordained from the beginning, yes. But it wasn't revealed until much, 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 much later. Okay? Let's continue. Who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the capital S spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. The word of God, lowercase w. There is only seven times within the scriptures where there is a uppercase w, word of God, and every single time it's talking about our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Word of God, what is the Word of God? The authorized version of the scriptures. Okay? And what does it say here? Which liveth and abideth forever. Beg your pardon. Verse uh, 24, for all flesh is as grass, here today, gone tomorrow, like a puff. And all the glory of man as the flower of grass, the grass withereth and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. <laughs> First Corinth come on, fingers work with me. Beg your pardon. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verses 1 on to verse 20. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. False convert. He's addressing false converts, not those who um, come to him broken and contrite. And have no confidence in themselves and the flesh. Because guess what? They're genius. The flesh profiteth nothing. But to the Catholic and the coadjutor, oh, the flesh is everything. Because the easy believism heretic, and just like the Catholic, their religion is a religion of flesh. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due, due time. For I am the least of the apostles, that am not me to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God, uh, notice Paul doesn't refer to uh, us as Christians. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach. And so ye believe. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. And it says in talking about that zombie apocalypse thing. If I can remember, I'll link that in this video as well, too. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. Boop. Obvious, right? And if Christ be not raised, 
your faith is in vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Because he ever liveth to make intercession. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished, dead. And right here, people are like, well, what if you're wrong? Well, number one, I'm not wrong, okay? But I've, how many times have you run into that from these <laughs> atheists? <laughs> there is no such thing as an atheist. There isn't. The atheist does believe in a God. Yes, themselves. Just like Satan. Lucifer, you know. I will be like the Most High. Yeah. But it's like, well, what if you're wrong? Number one, I'm not wrong. But, okay, let's, let's say it to Scripture. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead? and become the first fruits of them that slept. See, let me now, let me put this into you here. Go to 1 Corinthians here, chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. First Corinthians, or Second Corinthians, excuse me. Second Corinthians chapter 2. One second, I got to pause this. Okay, sorry about that. I misread my own notes. First Corinthians chapter 2. Ah, uh, verses 1 on to verse 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 on to verse 5. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech, you know, like tricks of rhetoric, being well-versed, hi, in the trivium, that kind of stuff, like Jesuits are. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech, or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. Verse 2. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the capital S spirit and of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Look at verse 2. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. To now go to Galatians chapter 2. Again, I can't get away from this of late. I can't. I, I, I just, when reading this and just studying this verse here in uh, Galatians chapter 2, it brings, it, it's, oh. <laughs> okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I will not know a wicked person. Save Jesus Christ in him crucified. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. When Paul is talking about, in verse 2 in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. 
Christ living within you, sealed unto the day of redemption. That's in Ephesians chapter 1. Go find it. Okay? He's talking about the one spirit that you and I of the church of the living God, the ground and pillar of the truth, have. And that is Jesus Christ himself, God the Father, and the Lord is that spirit that dwells within you. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Knowing those who have Christ within them, your brethren and sisters. See. Is Christ in you? Personally, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And over time, that will come to pass to show you who is and who ain't. And Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. The world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. And Romans chapter 12, verses 1 under verse 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, separate, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye... Okay, now... Many cannot be trans uh, uh, many cannot be conformed to this world, right? Yes, they can. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. <sighs> because second Corinthians, Chapter 5, verse 17. Yeah, a changed life. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You know, you're going to hear a lot about today of, you know, the resurrection and all this stuff from the church building. And if you go here on YouTube, you'll see these Luciferian uh, Catholic masses where they actually say Lucifer. <laughs> yeah, um, here, here's the bottom line, dear friend. What does it mean to you? What does it mean to you? Unto me personally, praise be to God for his unspeakable gift. I put him on that cross and he shed his blood to cleanse me of all my sins. He scared the hell out of me and broke me. And upon realizing him showing me through the scriptures, through the book of Romans, what he did because of me, how can you not love him for what he has done because of what you did to him? And because of what you did to him, you deserve to go to hell. And you devils can't get that. Oh, okay, some of you may, you devils may, but you relish in it. What does it mean to you? What does it mean to you? Think about these things. Because 
the hirelings in the buildings trivialize this. And I'm pretty much all favoring Catholicism. But until it is something personal, Anyway, that's going to be it for this video. Quick video, actually. There are some, uh, there are more videos coming, obviously. Um, hold on one second, let me show you something. I, uh, I am reading right now this book. Um, I'm going to be using this as a, going to be doing a video here on the Jesuits here sometime Hopefully this week, but we'll see. Um, got a lot of other things to read about and whatnot. But all, and also, um, as I said in the very beginning of this video, um, onto a brother who has um, shared with me some stuff. Um, Lord willing, that will come this week as well. Beautiful, beautiful. But um, anyway, uh, brethren, thank you so much. Um, we love you very much and we are praying for so many of you and pray for one another. Pray for one another. Don't let or allow these devils to make trivial the most precious thing that you as the church of the living God could ever know. Love you.